Go ahead and take a seat, and as you're doing so, grab your Bibles, your apps, whatever you read on, and turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, you don't have an app, uh, we've got Bibles under some of the chairs. Grab one of those. Uh, Romans is in the New Testament, which is kind of the, the last t- uh, third of the Bible. Uh, you'll find Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, then the book of Acts, and then Romans. Uh, if you get to any of the books that end in I-A-N-S, uh, like 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, any of those, you've gone too far and you need to back up, back to Romans. If I've confused you, use the table of contents. That's why God gave it to us, and thank you, Lord, for table of contents. Uh, So Romans chapter 5, that's where we're going to be today. Now, as you're turning there, let me tell you a story. I have been happily married for almost 14 years. End of July will be our uh, 14-year anniversary, and this ring right here almost didn't get put on my finger. As a matter of fact, the night before my wedding ceremony, there were serious questions as to whether this ring was gonna go on this finger. I've got your interest now, don't I? What? Pastor OC almost did, what happened? Okay, so let me tell you the story of my bachelor party. So, we had a great rehearsal for our wedding. We, we had dinner with all of our closest friends and family. And then afterwards, my best friends, all my groomsmen and all my buddies, we decided for my bachelor party that we would go play paintball. Um, now this is early 2000s, early mid 2000s. And so paintball places were all over the place. So we rented out a paintball facility, ordered a bunch of food and just played paintball for hours. We had a blast. It was so much fun. I remember at one point being so tired that I had to stop. At, we, we all stopped and we sat down and just drank water for like 10 minutes because we were dehydrated. We'd been playing so hard. We were having so much fun. Uh, but the the night turned on me. Uh, towards the end of our evening at this paintball facility, um, my friends, my best friend, which I wonder why he's my best friend sometimes, but my best friend uh, looked at everybody and said, okay guys, it is time to play a game of Hunt the Bachelor. You can kind of maybe guess what this involves. So let me describe this to you. Uh, I've got 25 guys that are with me and we're all having a blast. And Hunt the Bachelor is when all those 25 guys play against one guy, me, the Bachelor. And so it was, we went out onto the field and it was everyone against me. Now I can proudly stand here and say that before they got me, I took five guys out. So I, I held my own quite well, but they ended up hitting me. Now the wound, the, where they hit me was not, would not be considered a mortal wound. Like it wouldn't have killed me if it was real gunfire. But some could argue that it might as well have been a mortal wound because had my then fiance, now wife, discovered or known before the wedding that that had happened, she would have killed us all. I'll just say that because I got hit right here, right under the knuckle of my left ring finger. And the moment I got hit, I went, all right, I'm hit. And everybody stopped and realized they saw a big circle of paint right here. And everybody went, oh no. (laughs) Believe me, if you know my wife, there's a genuine level of healthy fear when it comes to her. And so we feared for our lives. So all of us rushed to the concession stand at this paintball facility and I shoved my hand in, in an attempt to hold back the swelling and bruising that was potentially gonna take place with my hand. I was popping Tylenol and ibuprofen like they were smarties, just ah! And praying to the Lord Almighty that he would salvage my hand and not create too much swelling or bruising. Because ladies, if we as your soon to be husbands ruin the wedding pictures, what happens? (laughs) 
So that's what I was worried about. Luckily, praise the Lord, woke up the next morning and there was just this, this teensy tiny little bruise right there, but there was no swelling. It, it, was, it was salvaged, it was saved. And we, my groomsmen and I, worshiped the Lord in salvation that morning when I woke up and told them that it was okay. Um, but wedding went off without a hitch. It was no problem. Uh, like I said, minor little bruise. You can't even see it in the pictures. But what sticks out to me in that event in my life is how quickly all of my friends turned on me. At one moment, we're having a blast. We're playing. We're having fun. We're all comrades. We're having a great time. And the very next moment, every single one of them turned on me. They went from being my friends to my enemies like that. Now, has anyone ever switched sides on you? Is that, has something like this ever happened where somebody turned on you or switched sides on you? Some of us may have stories, both funny and serious, when that has happened. Now, have you ever switched sides or ever turned on someone? Many of us could probably say, yes, we have. Again, some funny and some serious. But let me pose a thought to you. As followers of Christ, if you are a Christian, a follower of Christ, you have switched sides. We, as followers of Christ, we are traitors. It's a pretty harsh statement. But we are, we're traitors. If you are a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, you're a traitor because you have switched sides. You once lived in a life of sin and when you embraced a relationship with Christ, you became a traitor to that old life and embraced the new life that Jesus has for you, correct? And so we as Christians are traitors to our old life of sin. And this is great. It, most people aren't proud to say they're a traitor. But in this case, that's the right move. That's the thing to do. And here's why. Turn to Romans 5. This is where we look at God's word and see what it has to say about our alliances, about whose side we're on. So Romans 5, we're going to start in verse 6. Romans 5, verse 6. And it says this, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You see, we're traitors because we were enemies. We, at some point, every person was a traitor or was an enemy to Christ. That's what this passage says. Look at verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we're reconciled shall be saved by his life. This passage tells us that we were enemies. We were opposed to Jesus Christ and the work that he has for us. That's a pretty strong statement. But look at the words that this entire passage uses to describe us before we knew Christ. Verse 6 says that we were weak and ungodly. You Go to verse 8. Verse 8 says that we were sinners. Now, I don't know about you, but is sin in line with God or in opposition to God? It's in opposition. It's the opposite of what God wants for us. So if we were sinners and ungodly, we were opposed to him. We were his enemies. And then verse 10 just calls it out and says we were enemies, but we've been reconciled. So how? 
were we enemies? Because again, I know that that is a strong, harsh statement. I realize that no one says, oh, I was weak, I was ungodly, I was a sinner, and I was an enemy. That doesn't well up warm, fuzzy feelings in our heart, does it? So what, how are we enemies to Christ? Well, think back. If we were living in slavery to our sin, we served our sin, didn't we? And if we serve sin, then we don't serve God. And so there's an opposition there. You're against him or you're for him. And let me tell you a hard truth here. There's no middle ground when it comes to following Christ. You cannot be a neutral party and say, well, I'm not picking either side. I'm going to stay in the middle. That's not how spiritual, the spiritual world works. That's not how following Christ works. You are either for him or against him. There's nothing in between. It is a strict black and white dichotomy. It is for or against, nothing else, no possibility of neutrality. And so we are enemies because we lived in our sin. Our sin shackled us. Our sin enslaved us and we served the sin rather than the Savior. That's why we need Jesus Christ. So, we are traitors because we were enemies, but there is good news in this passage. And in reality, this whole passage that we're looking at this morning is about good news, not about condemnation, not about making us feel bad. This is about lifting us up because it's about good news. Look at verse eight. Verse eight says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Not while we were getting to know him, not while we were friends. When we were sinners in opposition to God, he died for us. And so the love of Jesus convinces us to switch sides. That love, that love that Jesus showed to die for us when we were opposing him convinces us to switch sides and no longer be Jesus' enemy, but follow Jesus with our life. That's what the good news is. And there's a great example of this in the New Testament. If you go to the book of Acts, uh, which is the fifth book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, uh, the very next book is Romans, where we're at right now. In the book of Acts, it tells uh, the account of all the different things that happened immediately after Jesus died, about what the disciples went and did and how the uh, word of God got spread all over the world. And in Acts 9, we read the beginning of the story of a very famous man named Paul. And Paul was this amazing disciple of Jesus. He went out and spread the gospel all over the world and really sacrificed his life to spread the good news of Jesus. But before he did that, he was a very strong enemy of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, his job was as a religious leader, he went from city to city to city looking for Christians and putting them in prison or having them killed. His job was to hunt Christians. I don't know about you, but there's not many things you could do that would be in more opposition to the work of Jesus Christ than hunting down Christians and having them thrown in prison or killed. And Paul has this amazing encounter with Jesus, this miraculous encounter, and he changes his life and dedicates everything in his life to Jesus Christ after that encounter. And he goes from being a very active enemy in opposition to being a very active follower and spreader of the gospel of Jesus. His life does a 180, completely changes And just like Paul, we are all enemies. We are. We are all enemies to the work of Jesus Christ before we know him. But just like Paul, Jesus loves you. And hear me. If you don't hear anything this morning, hear me on this. 
Jesus loves you. Right where you're at, right where you're going, he knows the mistakes, he knows your sin, he knows how you've fallen short. And believe me, if he could love Paul, a man who hunted Christians and had them killed, if he can love Paul, he can love you. He loves you. There's nothing you could have done, nothing you can do that will separate you from that love of Christ. He loves you. And it's about a broken relationship being fixed. I want you to look with me at verse 10. Verse 10 says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? I want you to notice that word reconciled. Because it's not a word that we use necessarily all that much. Reconcile is a relationship word. It is a word that means your relationship with someone was broken and it was reconciled, meaning it got put back together. It got fixed. And so if you came to me and said, you know, I've got this friend that our friendship has fallen apart and it's broken and I would like to put it back together. You're coming to me basically asking, can you help me reconcile my relationship? And so when verse 10 says that we were enemies, but now we've been reconciled to God through the death of Jesus Christ, that means that our broken relationship with Jesus, remember, we are enemies before we know Christ. We were enemies to him. That relationship is broken. Christ died on the cross, shed his blood, and then rose from the grave, taking that relationship and putting it back together. He reconciled our broken relationship with God. He, you see, he doesn't want us to be slaves to our sin anymore. He wants us to be free from that slavery of sin. He wants us to live in the freedom that is found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you want your relationship with God to be fixed, the only way to do that is through Jesus Christ. It is only available through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how you get right with God. So here's the question. Whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Because remember, I described that when it comes to following Christ, there's no middle ground. You can't be neutral in following Christ. You are either against him or you are for him. There's nothing in between. And so which side are you on? Looking back, 14 years, almost 14 years ago, I sat in a ceremony or stood in a ceremony and I put this ring on my hand as a lifelong commitment to my wife. And guys, I love my wife. That day changed my life in a huge way, and I'm proud of that. I love that I am Jana's husband. I love that we have two boys together. I love my life as a family man, and I'm proud of that. If you go on my social media, you're going to see a lot of pictures and a lot of bragging about my wife and my sons. That's who I am. I love that part of my life. But how many of us struggle to be proud that we've been reconciled with God through Jesus Christ. Because if you're on whatever side, you should be demonstrating that. When you pick a side, you choose that side, you live that life based on that allegiance. And so does your life show that you're a follower of Christ? Does your life just scream Jesus to the people around you? Well, let's look at some things about what that looks like. Look in verse 11. It says this, More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The fact of the matter is, if we, every single one of us, woke up in the morning, and before we started our day, Maybe get a cup of coffee first. But before we really start our day, we stopped and just rejoiced 
that we are reconciled to God. We have received the gift of reconciliation that we don't rightly deserve, but we get it anyways. If we just spent some time in the morning, every morning rejoicing in that, what would that look like in the rest of our day? How would that impact the way we live our lives day in and day out? If we just took a moment every morning and rejoiced in the fact that our relationship has been reconciled. It's been fixed by Jesus Christ. So we should be rejoicing. We should be thinking about that on a regular basis. And then that should then go and reflect on how we live because we're called not to just reflect, but to live differently. I mean, we here at Calvary, we talk about life change, that we are leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. When you step into that relationship with Jesus, when you begin following Jesus, that changes you. Your life will look different. And to a certain extent, your life should look differently enough that the people around you who do not know Christ will look at you and say, I don't know what they have, but I want it. Because they're changed and they're changed in a way that I want to be changed. And then through that, through people noticing, you will have the opportunity to either have a conversation with, Je- with them about Jesus or invite them to church. We're not asking you to be a spiritual, biblical genius. We're just saying invite them to church. We know Based on research, we know that six to seven out of every 10 people say they would go to church if someone would just invite them. Your life should scream the name of Jesus to the people around you and give you the opportunity when they come to you to then say, hey, why don't you come to church with me this Sunday? I go to the 11 o'clock service, let's go, and then we'll go eat lunch and we can talk. What an amazing opportunity that we have as followers to do that. Because let's be honest, is it right for us to have the life-saving and life-changing message of Jesus and just keep it to ourselves? Absolutely not. Our call is to take that life-changing relationship with Jesus and spread it everywhere. We've been saved And now our job is to help others come to know Jesus so they can be saved. And so Christian, it's time to live like Christ and open the door to lead others to him. And lastly, serve. Now, let me me say this before I get on my little soapbox for a minute. If you're not a Christian, none of this part applies to you. So you can just tune me out for the next two minutes. Just, Just static. Christian, it is not enough to come to church on the weekend and do nothing else. The Bible never says, go to church and that be it. You are called, we are all called as followers of Christ to serve Christ in his church and in the world. And if we go to church and that's all we do, you're missing the point. The Bible describes in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, you know, we're in Romans right now, so we'll get to this uh, here in a couple months. But the Bible describes the church, this, as the body of Christ. And it describes it as us all being parts of that body. Now, last night, my son went and hung out with a couple of his friends last night and he got home, uh, it was late, and we were like, hey Knox, how did, did you have fun? What did you do? And he goes, oh, it was so much fun. We played this game where we had to tape our thumb down and we had to try and do different things without our thumbs. He goes, it's really hard to write without your thumb. I was like, yeah, buddy, I bet it is. He goes, I couldn't even pick up a glass to take a drink of water without my thumb. It's really hard. And I was like, yeah, buddy, I, I bet it is. But think about that for a minute. Every part of your body actively serves a function in your body, correct? Every part of your body is on your body to do something. 
Your thumb doesn't show up and not do anything. It's active. It's necessary for the function of the body. You can't show up to church and be happy just sitting in the chair. You have to serve. Go make a difference. You have the life-changing message of Jesus. Go and serve and make it known to the world. It's not enough to go to church. That's the last thing God wants you to do if you stop there. Because we are called to so much more. If my thumb served no function, if it was dead, why would I keep it? And I don't mean to sound rude by this statement, but it's gonna come across rude. If you just show up and you sit in that chair and you do nothing else, you are wasting time and wasting space because you are not called to just sit and do nothing else. You're, you're called as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, to go change the world. And that's done through his body, through the church. And we have dozens of ministries here at Calvary that we could use volunteers and servants to go help. We need people over in our children's ministry and our student ministry and women's and men's and sportsmen and celebrate recovery. We have so many opportunities for you to serve and make a difference in Lake Havasu. So go find where you're supposed to serve. Stop showing up and sitting in the chair and doing nothing else. God calls you to so much more. Now, if you are not a Christian, tune me back in. If you're not a follower of Christ, if you do not have a life-changing relationship with Jesus, I think it's time today that you re reconsider what side you're on. I think it's time for you to begin having discussions about what it looks like to begin having a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, I've been talking about before Jesus, you are a spiritual slave to your sin and Jesus wants to set you free from that slavery so that you're not receiving punishment, you're receiving heaven. And here's what I want you to do. If you are not a follower of Christ and you're curious about this, you're, you're maybe asking some questions in your mind and in your heart, here's what I want you to do. At the end of the service, we're gonna sing a song and the worship leader is gonna go, hey guys, we're so glad that you were here. Have a great week, we'll see you later. And everybody's gonna stand up and they're gonna exit the building. When everybody stands up, instead of exiting, I want you to come to the front and talk to one of our prayer ministry team members. And this is not you saying, I'm making that commitment today. Maybe it is, and we would love to have that conversation with you, but that is not what I'm saying. I want you to just begin having a conversation about what following Christ looks like and what it means for you. We're not gonna pressure you to make a decision today. We just wanna begin the dialogue. We wanna have that conversation with you and answer your questions and clarify what following Christ means and what it looks like. So at the end of the service, I invite you to come down and do that. It's time to pick a side and live like you're on that side. No more neutrality, no more middle ground. You're either for him or against him and our lives should reflect that. Join me in prayer.